shoulder instability issues. So if we talk about the shoulder instability, the glenoid is a pear shaped structure and instability can be because of the labrum which is covering the glenoid in a 360 degree fashion. So this labrum can be detached from any of the portion. The most common site of detachment is between 3 to 6 o'clock and this is called as banka. Occasionally the labral tear may extend up to backwards in this region and that is called as a posterior labral tear or posterior banka. And the superior labrum if, and the part which is anterior and the posterior to the biceps together is called as a slap lesion. So there are three kinds of labral lesions which can lead to instability, bankard tear, posterior labral tear or a slap tear. The portion of the labrum superior to the bank, uh, labral tear between 3 o'clock to 2 o'clock, so 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, this portion may have a thickened MGHL which is called as a Buford lesion. Now this is a normal pathology, so you should not mistake before lesion for a labral tear. So before lesion is a thickened MGHL and or a, if this is also called as a, this may also be called as a sublabral foramen or sublabral hole. So these are the structures as far as the labral deficit is concerned. Now if you have dislocations again and again, along with the labrum, some part of the bone may also be involved. So that is called as a bony bank card. Now bony bank card is usually of two types. One is an attrition bank card and one is a fragment bank card or a fracture. So fragment bank card if it is there or if it is a fracture of the glenoid along with the labrum then you need to do a arthroscopic repair involving this. Attrition bank card or attrition lesion need to be quantified. If the attrition lesion is less than 20 degrees, you can do an arthroscopic procedure. If it is more than 20 degrees, you should do a bone block procedure. Bone block procedure are of many kinds, you will come to that shortly. Now apart from that, there are some other lesions. One of these lesions is called as a glad lesion. What is a glad lesion? It is a glenoid labral articular defect. So what happens is you have a labrum tear here and you have an articular cartilage defect here. This is called as a GLAD lesion. So GLAD lesion basically is a lesion of the labrum along with the cartilage injury on the glenoid face. So that is a GLAD lesion that is called. Now you can have some capsular injuries which are called as a Hagel and reverse Hagel. Hagel is on the anterior part and reverse Hagel is on the posterior part. So what is Hagel? It is humeral avulsion of glenohumeral ligament. So instead of on the glenoid side, the deficit is on the humerus. And if it is there, you, you will see a capsule which is lying free and you will see the muscle fibers directly. So if you go into the scope and you see the muscle fibers directly, that means the capsule is torn from the humerus and you need to fix it. So if it is anteriorly, it is called as a Hegel lesion. If it is posteriorly, it is called as a reverse Hegel lesion. Like tomorrow, yesterday, the case we saw had a reverse Hegel lesion along with the standard lateral lesion. Now if there is a bone loss which is more than 20 degrees, 20 percent, then you need to do a bone block procedure and there are many kinds of bone block procedures that is right. The most commonly done bone block procedures are lethargic and ICB, means iliac crest bone block. Lethargic is advantageous because it has a sling effect also. So if you talk about lethargic, it has got three parameters. Sling effect, bone graft and capsular repair. So there are three mechanisms of action of lethargy. Whereas if you talk about ICBG, it is only bone graft. But for a very large defect or very large bone loss, ICBG is better because this is limited by the size of the coracoid fracture and occasionally if you have a coracoid fracture something you cannot do. So iliac crest bone grafting is one option if you have a very large defect so you can take a iliac crest graft and put it and fix it up the space. Now fixation of the lethargy. Lethargy is basically defined as a 
coracoid transfer on the entire anterior tibia. Now tra traditionally they were fixed with screws, two screws, and this was actually described by Latarje, Gills, Walsh, and uh, many surgeons. Then there are many modifications to that. It's called modified Latarje. You put the uh, the coracoid like this. You can put coracoid like this. So it's a uh, some Gills Walsh is direct, and then is then is there is a congruent arc uh, Latarje in which the face of the glenoid is in the same uh, face. This is described by Barkha. Nowadays, there is another technique in which you put buttons on both the sides. So they, we don't put the screws, but we put buttons on both the sides and do a suture loop fixation. That is one technique that is uh, described and popularized by Pascal Goyle. And then there is a implantless lethargy in which we did two tunnels through the glenoid and two tunnels through the coracoid and fix it all together. So there is no implant, but it is fixed up with a suture tape and now, if we talk about the repair of the labral lesions, nowadays there are many anchors which are there. So, grossly speaking, you can have two kinds of anchors, knotted anchors and knotless anchors. Knotless anchors are push lock variants in which you can just pass the sutures through the labrum and then use a push lock kind of a device, a knotless kind of a device to pump it. The advantage is that there is no knot irritation. But this advantage is the the reducing is not as perfect. Knotted anchors are the most standard ones. You can use a number of anchors. Titanium anchors were used in the past. Nowadays we don't use it. Then you can use peak screws or biocomposite screws or bioabsorbable screws. Again, bioabsorbable use is declined over the time. You should not use bioabsorbable. So at present, either you use peak, biocomposite, or most commonly we are you are now using all suture anchors for fixation of the labrum. So all suture anchors, I'll just uh, tell you few of the names, brand names, because this is our preferred device nowadays. Now all suture anchors are of two types. One is a passive deployment and one is an active deployment. This is more classical, historical, older anchors. The uh, pioneer of that is Juggernaut from Zimmer Biomet. Juggernaut anchor is basically a very good anchor, very low profile anchor and simple anchor. You push it in and just take it out. It is a passive deployment. Now, active deployment examples are like suture fix from Smith and FU, in which you push the button to actually deploy the anchor. And then there is a two fix anchor in which you rotate the uh, knob to make a big ball kind of a thing from the anchor. So, suture fix or two fix anchor can be deployed as an active deployment anchor. Now, the other passive deployment is Iconics from uh, Striker and there are many other companies who are making these kind of anchors. The advantage of these particular anchors is there is no metal or plastic particles. So, there are very less chances of any abrasion to the articular cartilage. They are very safe anchors, low profile. The other part is that their drill is very small. So, it is like 1.3 mm drill. So, it is a very small drill. So, you don't have any problems. Uh, you can put more anchors and it does not cause bone attrition or bone here later on. So, these are the main uh, concepts you should know about shoulder instability.